Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Reich from Crime Talk. Thanks for watching. First, Lori Vallow, further explanation of the judge's order. Second, Umbrella Man, they're coming for you. Third, family pleads for help to locate a missing Georgia mother. Fourth, mom who gives up son's DNA in a cold case dies suddenly. Fifth, bar examinees are complaining. Get over it. Six, Ghislaine Maxwell wants to name names. Seven, a little comment about my wardrobe. And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Rice from Crime Talk. Thanks for watching. As always, if you haven't done so already, we would ask that you hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, as well as that little bell in the corner so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. Now, why is that important? Well, if you had been with us last night when we went live at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, like we do every Tuesday evening, you would have heard first. That's right, first, because it literally, the order was posted literally right before we started our live. That's the order that was issued by the court deciding that there may be a conflict between Mr. Means, representing both Lori Vallow, and his statements regarding Chad Daybell. We've put those videos up, and we could probably... Take a quick look at it again. Uh, the amount of resources that can be saved in order to allow that to happen, and given that I represent her husband, Chad Daybell, in the event that there's an issue there. Mr. Means, have you ever represented any of the alleged co-conspirators that are set forth in the criminal complaint? No, Your Honor, other than Mr. Daybell. Clearly, Mr. Means says that he represented both Vallow and Chad Daybell. It was an issue when the new felony charges came out. The judge inquired specifically of that, and there was a hearing. There was a closed, a sealed hearing. The only people that were allowed were the attorneys and presumably the defendants. Now, we all know that Lori Vallow didn't show up at her uh, video conference regarding the motion to reconsider that the DA had filed asking that no media be allowed to live stream the preliminary hearings, which are scheduled for August 3rd for Chad DeBell and uh, August 10th for Lori Vallow. Needless to say, the court issued an order late last night. It was signed July 28th, 2020 by the deputy clerk, but it states after an exhaustive analysis, the court finds that any conflict of interest has been adequately waived for the current proceedings. This case can proceed forward with current counsel. As we discussed last night, and nobody else was even aware of this order, but we were here talking about it, basically says there was a conflict. It's waivable. I personally disagree with the court's findings, and I don't think that you can waive a conflict such as this. Let's take a quick look at some of the rules that attorneys have to abide by. First, the ABA Model Rule 1.9, subparagraph C, an attorney duties to preserve a client's confidential information does not cease when the representation ends, all right? Opposing a former client, confidential information, specifically, once again, Model Rule of the ABA Association 1.9A, when a former client, assuming Mr. Means represented Mr. Vallow, a former, when a former client has imparted confidential information to the lawyer, the lawyer must not then oppose the former client in any manner in which the confidential information would be relevant unless the former client consents after consultation. Well, that consultation has to be with independent counsel, and if that independent counsel were to say that there is a conflict and it's not waivable, that would be it. I can't imagine any attorney would say that. So in my humble opinion, Mr. Means' statements to the court where he had stated he represented Mr. DeBell and then 
said that he did not, based upon the court's specific inquiry, certainly required a further hearing on the matter. I wish the court would have been subject to that hearing, but for obvious reasons, it was not. The obvious reason being they were discussing attorney-client confidences and communications. And in this particular case, the court stated that any conflict of interest has been adequately waived. Like I said, I'm not a big proponent of waiving conflicts of interest. I think they create big issues down the road because for a client to waive a conflict of interest, they need to be advised of all the information. And frankly, yes, everybody's happy now. They're all working hand in hand for probably a common defense or under a joint defense agreement. However, things change rapidly. And if that's the case, you can see one side pulling the pin on Mr. Ming, which could mean basically a delay for a new attorney to get up to speed. I wish the court had said, you're not going to risk a further delay in these proceedings because of a conflict. Ms. Vallow, get your new attorney now and not four months or six months down the road. We'll see how it shakes out and whether I was right. Next on the docket, in Minnesota, there is the notorious and mysterious Umbrella Man. That's right. This man purportedly goes around and basically starts hate and discontent. He's been videotaped and photographed where he goes to a scene, will create damage to the property and basically say free stuff. And rioters would go in and basically loot the place. No one knew exactly who this mysterious umbrella man was, but now the police have asked for a warrant to get his phone records. And the suspect, and we'll give him the presumption of innocence, is a man identified by the police in their affidavit of Mitchell Wesley Carlson. He is 32. And as we've discussed before, those phone records can put you at a lot of locations within a very confined space. And in the application to the district court judge, the police are seeking subscriber information, call and text records, and cell tower data, and locations for May 27th during the day Umbrella Man was recorded breaking out the windows of an AutoZone store across the street from the police precinct that was the focus of an individual protesting George Floyd's death. This Umbrella Man has been dressed in all black, wearing a gas mask and carrying a black umbrella, spray painting words, free shit for everyone zone. It's alleged in the affidavit that the source believes that this is Mr. Carlson, but she does not want to come public because she is in fear of Mr. Carlson. It is alleged that he is a member of the Hell's Angels as well as the Aryan Cowboys, which is a white supremacist gang based in Minnesota and Kentucky. It's the police's allegation that this mysterious umbrella man was there to create hate and discontent, as well as have protesters begin stealing things and create race tensions throughout uh, the riots. It is the authorities' theory that Mr. Carlson is Umbrella Man, and because of his affiliations that he created a situation to create hate, discontent, and further problems regarding race relations. The telephone data won't lie. We'll see if Mr. Carlson is Umbrella Man or if they've got the wrong man. Next on the docket, a family pleads for help to locate a missing Georgia woman. The missing Georgia mother, Layla Cavett, had her three sisters hoping that their pleas will somehow bring information that leads to her whereabouts. Layla's three sisters went to Florida to meet with the detectives after their two-year-old nephew was found alone wandering in Miramar nearing the 1860 block of Southwest 68th Avenue. When citizens and police became concerned and asked, where's your mommy? The child just pointed kind of everywhere, according to witnesses. The two-year-old was unable to effectively communicate, and it was essentially baby talk. If anyone has any information, please contact authorities in Miramar, Florida. Next on the docket... The mom who gives up her son's DNA in a cold case dies suddenly. That's right. A DNA hair sample 
convinced a Georgia judge to overturn the double murder conviction of a man who spent 20 years in prison following the 1985 killings of a church deacon and his wife. Days after the judge overturned Dennis Perry's conviction, the woman who provided the hair sample, which implicated her son, Eric Spar, as the suspect, was found dead in her home. Gladys Spar's autopsy results haven't been released, but the Georgia Bureau investigation hasn't said whether foul play was in fact suspected in her death. The court's ruling vacating the conviction for Mr. Perry related to information obtained by Spar's then alibi, a former boss who said that he was working and was with him. That former boss disavows any knowledge of any call whatsoever. Additionally, it turned out the case against Perry was hinged upon the testimony of Jane Beaver, the mother of Perry's ex-girlfriend. Beaver was apparently paid $12,000 by the district attorney's office as reward money for her testimony, but that information was never disclosed to the judge as well as to the defense. We've talked about that before. That is exculpatory information. It goes directly to one's motive to fabricate and their bias in a particular case. Additionally, there was newly discovered DNA evidence that links another suspect. And as we stated, Mr. Spar's alibi for the night of that murder has been fabricated. As of today, Mr. Dennis Perry has not been charged with the murders going back to 1985. We'll be looking for any new information regarding the cause of death of Mr. Perry's mother, Gladys. Next on the docket, bar examinees are complaining. That's right. Imagine just spending the last three years of your life acquiring large amounts of debt to go to law school, only to have your bar exam delayed or completely changed because of the COVID-19 crisis. Now, some states like Virginia are still making everyone appear in person for the exam, and you still have to wear a suit and tie if you are a man, as well as appropriate attire for the ladies. In Oklahoma, people have to show up. In some states, for example, like Michigan, you are able to take it on your laptop. And there's apparently some sort of software that looks at your eyes to see if you're glancing away too much, i.e. cheating or looking at other reference material. But wait, there's even more, because during the second part of the exam in Michigan, the test takers could not get in to part two because of an attack of the software manufacturer's system. ExamSoft pushed out an email to everyone after they learned of this apparent glitch through Twitter. And therefore, the second module of the exam started shortly thereafter, according to an ExamSoft spokesperson. Now, a lot of people that were taking these exams were complaining. This is not the way things are planned. And my advice to these young lawyers who will hopefully pass the bar successfully is welcome to the practice of law. All right. Things never go exactly as planned. You can plan it, think it's all going to be great. You've got your witnesses. And as soon as somebody hits that witness stand, it all changes because somebody wasn't telling you the truth. Some information is completely brand new that nobody expected. Get used to it. When your boss says, I need a brief written by Monday morning and you had plans to go out of town, that's right. You better say, Yes, sir or ma'am, I will have it ready for you because that's what they're going to expect of you. You're going to be expected to work 80 to 100 hours a week only to be told that you've wasted the client's time and money on something that was completely a tangent to which you have gone off on a research project for. Get used to it. It's called the practice of law. It's called the practice of life. So things going wrong at the bar exam, get used to it. Welcome to the practice of law. Next on the docket, that's right. Everyone needs a background search subscription. Go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up so that you can do a background search on anyone in the United States. The beautiful thing is you can do it anonymously. You get to search literally millions of records. And when you get that report prepared literally while you wait, it will include 
phone numbers, email addresses, social media information. It'll include criminal history, property records, civil judgments, divorce and marital records. You need to get this. We have received so many people that have said, Scott, thank you for letting me be aware of this service. You've literally probably saved my life. We've had people that have found out that their future business partners were scam artists. We've had people find out that their future boyfriends were sex offenders of children, for goodness sakes. Ladies and gentlemen, go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up. You'll be glad you did. Next on the docket, Ghislaine Maxwell wants to name names, but you may be a little surprised of the names she wants to tell. That's right. Ghislaine Maxwell, through her attorneys, have filed requests with the court to be able to disclose the names of the people making accusations against her and her former boyfriend slash boss. The prosecution wants nothing of that because they believe it's nothing more than an attempt to smear the complaining witnesses and to drag their names through the mud. The United States attorney in their pleadings wants a restricted use of any of the complaining witnesses' names. Only two people have come forward to date, and they both appeared at Ms. Maxwell's uh, detention hearing and arraignment, asking that her bond be denied. We will see if the court will grant a protective order as it relates to Ms. Maxwell's attorneys and what and whose name they can name. It's going to get interesting. Doesn't sound like Miss Maxwell's going down without a fight, at least not yet. And yes, as always, today is day 27 on the Ghislaine Maxwell suicided watch, 27 days from her arrest where she has not been suicided. The count will continue. Next on the docket, something a little hurtful last night was said in some of the comments. Somebody said, it looks like Scott wears cheap suits. Now, you can call me lots of things. You can tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. But to say that I wore a cheap suit, that's just downright insulting. And I'm not saying this to brag, but I'm saying this to show this is quality. Ladies and gentlemen, I, for as long as I can remember, have had my suits and shirts custom tailored. And in fact, if anyone's ever received a custom made suit, you will know that they will put your name on the inside pocket so that apparently you never have your jacket taken away. But no, what do I have stated in my inner pocket? Let's take a look. Could you see that? It says crime pays. That's in every suit that I've had for at least the last 19 years. So you can say lots of things about me, but don't say my suit looks cheap. Next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you can't make this stuff up. Life is stranger than fiction. That's right. Today, our dumb criminal contestants come from Massachusetts. And once again, it's a couple. That's right. Well, let's talk about what they did. Apparently, they went for a nude stroll the other evening, and they were spotted with their dogs early Monday morning near their Massachusetts home. Responding to the 911 call about the naked duo, police encountered the couple around 6.30 a.m., Investigators say that Marielle Kinney, 32, and Kevin Pinto, 30, were accompanied by their dog, Lucy, as they walked near their home in Hopkins, a small town 30 miles west of Boston. When the police questioned Kinney and Pinto about their state of undress, the pair allegedly became very confrontational after answering some questions somewhat incoherently. After yelling and swearing at the police, the couple sought to run away, but they were quickly corralled. What followed, according to police, charges were a violent scrum during which Kenny and Pinto struck Hopkins Police Department officers who required minor treatment. Both Kenny and Pinto were ultimately restrained and placed in custody. They were each charged with indecent exposure, assault, and battery on a police officer, resisting arrest, disorderly conduct, and disturbing the peace. 
ladies and gentlemen, I understand it. It's America. If you want to be able to walk your dog in the early morning hours nude, you probably should be able to do that. But you may want to check with the local laws because when you're charged with indecent exposure, guess what? You could have to register as a sex offender in many jurisdictions. Assaulting a police officer is still a felony in most jurisdictions. Wrap yourself up. Maybe wear a thong. Do something that lets you really say who you are. But you don't need to expose yourself like that or assault police officers. So our little nude dog strollers, you are our dumb criminal contestants of the day. Now, a lot of people ask, how many people who have been crowned the dumb criminal contestant of the week have ever accepted their coffee mug? Zero people have claimed their coffee mug. But guess what? I think if these two get it, they're going to do it. And if they're watchers of Crime Talk, guess what? They should have said that they were doing some acid with Jesus last week and playing a virtual reality game. You're probably going to get off easy with the cops, and you could claim your Crime Talk mug. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.